February 16, 2003, a small red Peugeot 307 speeds down a frozen Belgium highway. Inside the car are two men. One is Leonardo Notar Bartolo, a jewel dealer from Italy with an office in Antwerp's diamond district, where 80% of the world's diamonds are bought and sold. Next to Leonardo is his friend, Speedy, a nervous wreck that seems to be on the verge of a panic attack. In the back seat of the small car is a large black trash bag, tied up but full to the point of bursting. The two pull off the highway and onto a lonely dirt road, following it into a thick stand of trees. From this spot, the highway is no more than an echo of occasionally speeding cars. Miles from civilization, the grove of trees is silent between the passing cars, and the duo inside the small Peugeot glance out into the night, listening. Notarbartolo is calmed and collected, Speedy not so much. Getting out of the car, Notarbartolo tells Speedy to stay put, he's going to have a look around. He walks into the darkness and finds a small pond with a shed beside it, yet no signs of civilization or any recent visitors. The spot seems perfect, nice and remote. Making up his mind, he heads back to his car. Stepping back into the grove of trees, Notarbartolo can't believe his eyes. Speedy is rushing back and forth, trash bag in hand, hurling papers into the bushes and ripping out the video tape from cassette tapes. Israeli and Indian currency floats through the air, scattered everywhere as Speedy rampages in a full-blown nervous breakdown. All around the muddy floor are the specks of tiny glittering diamonds. Speedy and Notarbartolo aren't really gem dealers, they're gem thieves, some of the world's best, and the trash bag whose contents are now scattered all over the forest is the only evidence left linking them to what would be called the diamond heist of the century. With over $100 million in diamonds and jewelry stolen from the world's most secure vault. A year and a half earlier, Notarbartolo is sitting at a cafe, enjoying a break from his fake job as a gem dealer in Antwerp's diamond district. This is the world's epicenter for the diamond trade, and all around Notarbartolo are burly men armed with handguns, wheeling away suitcases full of gems, security personnel driving armored cars full of wealth, and diamond dealers with black briefcases handcuffed to their wrists, imposing bodyguards watching their every move. Customers and sellers from all over the world form a crowd around Notarbartolo, and like a wolf in sheep's clothing, no one has a clue that the world's best thief is sitting in their midst, calmly sipping an espresso. Notarbartolo is in his early 50s, a professional thief for life. Having pulled off dozens of successful heists, he no longer steals because he has to, he does it because he was born to do it. His very first robbery was at age 6, his mother had sent him out to buy milk, but Notarbartolo had found the milkman dozing. Reaching into the dozing milkman's pockets, he fished out 5,000 lira, or about 8 bucks, and helped himself to a bottle of milk. When his mother found out, she beat him, but Notarbartolo knew he had found his life's calling. Growing up, he stole from his teachers in elementary school, and when he became a teenager, he started stealing cars and even learned how to pick locks. With a growing reputation, Notar Bartolo set his sights on bigger fish, and in his 20s, he started studying people so as to best learn how to rob them. He followed jewelry salesmen around Italy for weeks, observing their every move so he could understand their habits. Then, once he knew his marks routines better than they did, he struck, making off with loads of precious gems and jewelry. As the master thief entered his 30s, his ambitions grew yet again, and he began assembling teams of professional thieves to tackle ever more difficult and lucrative targets. He would put together lock-picking experts, alarm aces, safe crackers, tunnelers who could penetrate any vault from below, and even a man who could scale the sleek exterior of an office building. Honing their arts and preparing for jobs in Turin, Italy, the group of professional thieves came to be known as the School of Turin. Notar Bartolo was the mastermind and specialized in charm. He'd play the part of a jeweler and befriend his marks, often being invited into offices, workshops, or even vault rooms to inspect merchandise. All the while, his mind was furiously making notes of his surroundings, keeping track of the exact number of steps he took so he could figure out size and dimensions of a vault, spotting security devices and any special features that would have to be defeated by his team. Then, a week or a month later, he and his team struck, stealing the entire inventory in the course of a single night. Then one day in his late 40s, as he sipped his espresso in the midst of Antwerp's diamond district, a Jewish gem dealer approached him, sitting down and making an offer. Notar Bartolo would be paid 100,000 euros to answer one single question. Could the vault in Antwerp Diamond Center be robbed? The answer was an obvious no. Antwerp's Diamond Center vault was the most secure in the world, and Notar Bartolo himself kept part of his stash locked up inside it. 
The vault was two floors below the main floor with a lock that had 100 million possible combinations. Infrared detectors monitored for body heat inside the vault, and heat detectors would trigger an alarm if they detected any rise in ambient temperature, such as the fraction of a degree raise in temperature that a man's warm breath might cause inside the temperature-controlled vault. Doppler radar blasted the inside of the vault, detecting even the most minute of vibrations or movements, and a magnetic field would trigger an alarm if the vault door was opened. Upstairs, a security force was on constant alert, ready to descend with automatic weapons at the first alarm. But for 100,000 euros, Nota Bartolo was happy to show his client just how impossible the task really was, and so he armed himself with a tiny pen camera, which he placed in his breast pocket. The small spy camera, capable of taking 100 high-resolution images. Because Notar Bartolo rented an office in the Diamond Center and kept his own gems and jewelry in the main safe, he could gain access into the building and even the vault itself, all the while snapping off hundreds of photos. The vault was guarded with a three-ton steel door with a combination wheel that needed a precise code to open. The door itself was impervious to drilling, rated to withstand 12 hours of non-stop drilling. Though the moment a drill touched the metal, a seismic sensor would be triggered, and the security force upstairs would be on its way. On the interior lip of the door and on the inside of the doorframe were a pair of metal plates, and when armed, a magnetic field passed between these plates. Any movement of the door would break the field and trigger an alarm. The only way of disarming the field was to input a code in a nearby keypad. The main lock itself needed a nearly impossible to duplicate foot-long key to finally grant entry. Cameras covered every inch of the vault inside and out, as well as all the exterior approaches to the building and even the sky above it. Five months after showing his client the photos and telling him a heist was impossible, Notar Bartolo received a call from a blocked number. On the other end of the line was a familiar voice. Meet me at this address, was all the voice said, and moments later a text with an address appeared on his phone. Later that day, Notar Bartolo arrives at an abandoned warehouse well outside of Antwerp, and any prying eyes. The small Jewish gem dealer greets him with a curt nod, and wasting no time, tells him that he wants to introduce him to some people. Inside the empty warehouse is a huge structure covered with black plastic tarps. Curiously, Nota Bartolo approaches it, and he and the gem dealer duck under the plastic, and a stunned Nota Bartolo finds himself standing in the antechamber to the Diamond Center's vault. It's an exact replica down to every minute detail, carefully reconstructed from his photos. Inside the vault, three Italian men are having a quiet conversation and stop talking as soon as the dealer and Nota Bartolo approach. The men don't give their real names, instead referring to each other only by nicknames. This way, if one gets caught, he's unable to finger the rest. One of the men introduces himself. He's known as the genius, and he specializes in alarm systems, any kind of alarm system. He tells Nota Bartolo that he can disable most of the vault's alarms remotely, but some he'll have to do himself. Next, a tall, muscular man shakes Nota Bartolo's hand with a firm, almost overpowering grip. The others call him Monster, and tell Nota Bartolo that they call him that because he's monstrously good at everything, but also because of his huge physical strength and intimidating demeanor. Behind the genius and the monster, a small, unassuming older man quietly waits for his introduction, calling himself the King of Keys. He has a kind, grandfatherly demeanor to him, and his job will be to duplicate the foot-long vault key that's supposed to be impossible to duplicate. He tells Nota Bartolo that all he'll need is a clear video of the key, and he'll handle the rest. Nota Bartolo tells him that getting a video of the well-guarded key won't be easy, but the king simply shrugs his shoulders and tells him that that's his problem. The team is in place, the target has been chosen, and in a few weeks the monthly De Beer shipment of diamonds will be trucked in and stored inside the vault, up to $100 million in precious stones ready to be plundered. The day is Friday, February 14th, one day before the heist. Nota Bartolo is buzzed into the vault alone, and though a camera watches his every move, the security guard on the other end has become accustomed to Nota Bartolo's comings and goings to access his safe deposit boxes. As he approaches his deposit box, though, Nota Bartolo takes one quick step to his left and pulls out a small aerosol can of women's hairspray, covering the interior heat and motion sensor with a coat of transparent, oily mist. The oily film will block the sensor's ability to read fluctuations in the room's temperature, and the alarm it was connected to would only go off if it sensed both heat and motion. Yet nobody knew just how long the trick would actually work, and it needed to last long enough for the monster to later enter the vault and install the sensor bypass. The crew thinks he may have five total minutes before his body heat is detected, but nobody is really sure. 
Later that night, the Diamond District is deserted, save for the permanent police on station 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Notabartolo drives in a rented Peugeot 307 on a road that skirts the edge of the district, and pulling to the curb, the monster, the genius, the king of keys, and Speedy exit, carrying large duffel bags. The rest of the team isn't happy about Speedy being on the job, but Notabartolo vouches for his lifelong friend. Still, Speedy has a reputation for breaking down toward the end of a job and getting far too nervous for his or the team's own good. Nevertheless, the team accepts him on Notabartolo's word, though the monster keeps a very close eye on him. Picking the lock on a rundown office building, the team slips inside undetected. At the rear of the building, they exit out into a private garden that rests up against the back of the Diamond Center and is one of the few places in or near the district that isn't under constant surveillance. Using a ladder that he'd previously hidden there, the genius climbs up to a small terrace on the second floor of the Diamond Center. There, an infrared detector is alert for intruders, but using a polyester shield, the genius slowly moves his way to the sensor and finally puts his shield directly in front of it, disabling the sensor. The rest of the team climbs up, and the genius disables an alarm sensor on one of the balcony's windows, like it's child's play, opening the window wide enough for the team to then drop into a stairwell. They're now inside the Diamond Center, with a fully staffed security force just a floor above them. Descending the stairs, the team enters the vault's antechamber and covers the security cameras with black plastic bags before flipping on the lights. For anyone watching, the lights would appear to still be off. Approaching the massive vault door, the genius pulls out a custom-made slab of rigid aluminum and affixes heavy-duty double-sided tape on one side of the slab, then sticks it to the two metal plates that regulate the magnetic field on the right side of the vault door. Next, he unscrews the bolts that hold the magnetic plates to the door and the door's frame. And, with the sticky tape attached to the aluminum slab holding the two plates together, he simply removes them from the door and tapes them to the wall. The magnetic field still thrums between the two stuck together plates, but now the door is no longer protected. The King of Keys is up next, and he moves to finish the copy of the vault key that he's made from Notabartolo's videos. But then he freezes, a thought striking him. In Notabartolo's videos, the guards almost always visited a nearby utility room before opening the vault. And working off his hunch, the thieves break into and search the room to reveal the original vault key hanging inside. Grabbing the original key, the king slides it into place and the genius dials the locks combination, also gleaned from watching Notabartolo's very detailed videos. The tumblers fall into place with a final click and the team holds its breath. The door is unlocked. With a nod, the genius motions to the monster who turns off the lights. A light detector in the vault could be triggered when the door was opened if not. In the pitch dark, the king of keys turns the key and spins the handle, swinging open the giant metal door. As the door opens, Speedy rushes back up the stairs so he can call Notabartolo on his cell phone, saying simply, we're in, and hanging up. Sitting outside in the rented Peugeot, Notabartolo watches the front of the Diamond Center. The police scanner on his dash is quiet, and there's no sign of activity within or outside the district. Inside the vault's antechamber, the King of Keys picks the lock on the metal grate that is the last remaining barrier between the team and the interior of the vault. The monster grabs two paint cans from the utility room and wedges them into place to hold the metal grate open. Then the large man takes a deep breath, focuses on his heartbeat and his breathing, working to control both. The heat sensor that Notabartolo had covered with hairspray earlier in the day is still operational, and though heavily muted, it will eventually pick up the monster's body heat through the oily film. He has to control his heartbeat and his breathing both if his body is already projecting heat to the temperature-controlled vault, and if he doesn't carefully control himself, his body would generate even greater amounts of heat. Having practiced the operation hundreds of times in the warehouse, the monster carefully enters the pitch-black vault and moves exactly 11 steps into the middle of the room reaching for the ceiling and pushing back a panel. Inside, he feels the security system's main inbound and outbound wires. Along these wires, an electronic pulse shoots constantly in and out of the vault. If any of the sensors were tripped, the circuit would break. As the pulse came into the room, it expected an answering pulse, and if it didn't get one, it would activate the alarm. Reaching in the pitch black, the monster uses a tool to very carefully strip the plastic coating from the wires. He's working with his hands above his head, the stress of maintaining this position causing his muscles to tremble. Any slip of the knife into the actual wiring would instantly break the circuit and trip the alarm. To make matters worse, the strain is causing him to sweat, which is increasing his body temperature. The team thought the heat sensor could be fooled for 5 minutes maximum, but nobody really knows for sure. 
With the copper wires exposed, the monster clips a new pre-cut piece of wire between the inbound and outbound cables, effectively creating a bridge that reroutes the incoming electric pulse to the outbound wire before it ever reaches the sensors. The monster has done it. The room is now completely cut off from the outside world. Taking no chances, the team immediately goes to work, covering up the heat and motion detector with a styrofoam box and light detector with tape. The King of Keys then takes a handmade, hand-cranked drill out of his bag and gets to work on the locks to the individual storage boxes. A power tool would be faster, but it would also make a great deal of noise. Three minutes later, the lock breaks and the box snaps open, revealing the priceless gems and diamonds inside. The team has memorized every single detail of the vault and work in complete darkness not willing to risk setting off the light detector. They turn their flashlights on only for brief moments as they reposition the drill on the next box, working in complete silence. Their bags, meanwhile, are filling with gold bars, diamonds, gems, and millions in various foreign currencies. By 5.30 am, the team has been inside the vault for six hours, and their bags are filled to bursting. 109 boxes have been opened out of 160, and yet even though the world has no idea the men are inside the vault, they need to leave, now, before the streets start filling with people. Speedy rushes back up the stairwell to call Nota Bartolo, telling him that they're on the way out. Loaded with loot, it takes the team an hour to carry the duffel bags up the stairs, bypassing the infrared sensor, lowering the bags down the ladder, and make their way through the abandoned an office building to Nota Bartolo's car. Gathering in Nota Bartolo's apartment, the team cheers. The heist is complete and nobody will have a clue until Monday morning when the dealers return to work. The bags are filled with currency and smaller stones, but the real loot is in the black leather satchels that the diamond dealers keep their diamonds in. The monster reaches inside a duffel bag and whips out one of the satchels, unzipping it, to discover it's empty. Bewildered, he takes out another satchel and another, but they're all empty. Rifling through the satchels and the other duffel bags, the team finds that most of them are empty. The diamonds, which should have been there, are almost all gone. We've been set up, says Nota Bartolo. The team makes salami sandwiches in the kitchen and discuss their situation. The satchel should have been full of diamonds from the De Beers shipment, and they should have earned a total take of over $100 million. Now they're looking at only a fraction of that, about $20 million. A thought struck Nota Bartolo. Maybe the dealer had set them up. Perhaps he had planned this with the rest of the dealers and pulled their inventories out of the vault just before the heist so that when the robbery was discovered they could claim the diamonds had been stolen and collect insurance money for the stones that they would all then secretly sell later. For the team, it didn't matter. If they had been set up, they would never find the dealer again and at least there was still $20 million in loot to split. Two days later, the team had already gone their separate ways, and Nota Bartolo and Speedy were on the highway on their way back to Turin, Italy. In the back seat of the car is the black plastic bag full of the only evidence linking them to the crime. Next to him, Speedy is melting down. The setup was more than he could take, and the normally nervous Speedy is now in full-blown panic mode. He can't go any further with the bag of evidence in the car with him, and he tells Nota Bartolo to pull off onto a lonely country road. It's perfect, he says, and reluctantly Nota Bartolo agrees. This is where they'll burn the trash, erasing all evidence linking them to the crime. When Nota Bartolo returns from inspecting the burning location, he finds Speedy having a full-blown panic attack. There's trash and currency everywhere, and small diamond stones glitter in the mud. Enraged, Nota Bartolo orders Speedy to calm down, and the two spend hours picking up any incriminating evidence, leaving the rest scattered about the grove of trees, looking like nothing more than trash. In the weeks that followed, a local farmer would discover the trash and, believing it was a bunch of kids dumping on his property, notify the police. When he discovered even more bundles of trash, he grew incensed and called the police back. This time, they had him list the pieces of trash he found, and when the farmer mentioned a diamond center envelope, the police immediately took interest in this seemingly random pile of trash. An invoice for a low-light surveillance system bearing Nota Bartolo's name, as well as DNA evidence from a discarded bit of salami sandwich, would go on to incriminate the professional jewel thief, who would be charged with leading the team of thieves in the vault heist. Sentenced to 10 years in prison, he was let off on parole early and today is a free man, under very careful scrutiny. As far as the Jewish gem dealer who ordered the heist, when the team went up to meet up with him at their designated rendezvous point to split their loot, he never showed. 
Nota Bartolo claims that the team was played, but the police believe that the entire story of a Jewish gem dealer was a story made to cover up for the fact that the heist was actually orchestrated by the Italian Mafia. Given that Nota Bartolo's own cousin was at the time slated to become the head of the Italian crime syndicate. The stolen gems, however, were never recovered, and the identity of the alleged Jewish dealer who orchestrated the entire plan or his motivations have never been discovered. Was the heist really a setup for insurance fraud? What do you think really happened? Also, make sure you check out our other video, Thief Who Hijacked a Plane and Stole a Million Dollars. See you next time.